We are in one of the most historic theaters in the city. And Scott Stapp is a man of his word because when he called me last week and we talked about the tour, yeah. you said, yeah, come to the show and we'll sit down and hang out and have more of a chance to talk. And here we are. Here we are. So thank you for being a man of your word and no making problem. time for me. No problem. Good to see you. Um, it's good to see you too. One of the things we were talking about when you called last week was the long history with you and obviously Creed and WAF. Yeah. And as we yeah. get set to celebrate our 50th anniversary, I, I really wanted to ask you, and they're doing sound check back there, so it's gonna be noisy, but it looked too good not to sit up here on the balcony. Um, I wanted to talk to you about the early days of Creed and yeah. what it was like for you when you came to Boston the first uh, time. I've got, I've got a great story about that. All right, I wanna hear it. We, uh, we pulled in in a van and trailer. Because back then, yep. there's no buses back we, then. We didn't have a bus yet. Uh, we were just getting started. We parked right in front of the hotel. I think we went to the radio station and actually did a performance. Yeah. Um, uh, that morning or the day before. Yeah, there's nothing like getting the and bands in there first thing in the morning to play yeah. acoustic. And like so you guys getting out of bed early. We, we got up early. We did that. Um, and then we ended up at the hotel. And so we come out of the hotel the following morning. And our van is on blocks. <laughs> the wheels are gone. And the trailer has been taken off our van, the, the chains connecting it cut, and the trailer gone. I don't even think I've ever heard this story. And so, and so all our gear for the show that night was stolen. And being an upstart of a band, you're duct taping gear together well, and these guitars this stuff has sentimental meaning as well, well as financial value i, right? I was going to bring that up because yeah. um at that point in time in our career uh mark was playing les paul oh. and uh that's before he switched to prs right and so he had his les paul that i guess he got from his parents as a gift oh. when he was maybe 14 15 years old uh don't hold me to that number but I know it was like his prized possession and uh and that was taken um and so they found the trailer like I don't know somewhere uh you know miles and miles away uh everything gone um and so that night we had to do a show and so we played our first show in Boston uh using fuel using their gear <laughs> Because Fuel was uh, out on tour with us, uh, and uh, so they played, and then we just used their gear and made it through the show, and it was an awesome show. Uh, we had a great time. The turnout was great, uh, but that was my that was our first experience in Boston as a band. Oh my God! And <laughs> you know, for somebody that works in the trades, or it would be like somebody you know stealing all your tools yeah. and having to use somebody else's tools yeah, it was, or you it's just not quite the same well there was there was not only was there you know are you upset but there like you said there was an emotional attachment yeah. uh, to some of those instruments because we weren't at a place yet where we had endorsements and you know tons of guitars and you know we had bought our own stuff and so this was stuff that we had purchased with our own money or, or gotten as a gift as a child uh, and so for years, for years, we've been trying to find. You still haven't uh, found still it? That, that Les Paul, as far as I know, that Les Paul has never been found. And so if anyone's out there <laughs> and you know where that Les Paul is, please. Yeah, Mark wants it back. Mark wants it back. And it would be amazing. We would take care of you, trust me, if you can get that guitar back to us. So you never found, like, no. you never got the tires back? You never? Well, we, no, we had to get new, <laughs> oh you know, we had, to, we had to go buy new tires and. And we got the trailer back. Yeah, but no tires but, on that, but, right? The but, chain's all broken. It, yeah, and so. But hey, the show was amazing, and you guys were banging our records, and we had such a great experience with WAAF. You guys were one of the first stations to play Creed in the country, and, and uh, you know, we owe a lot of our success to you guys, so we appreciate it. Well, that's what I wanted to talk to you about, because you guys were one of those bands that just toured all the time. Yeah. So the first time you come to town, you get your you get your tires stolen and your <laughs> gear taken. But as the airplay kept going, not just here in Boston, but as the band began to grow, right? you know, you come back to town and the venue's a little bit bigger. Yeah. And then maybe you get a tour bus. And when did you guys really kind of know 
okay, this is real now? Like, is there a moment that you remember that you go, okay, I think, I think I'm going to have to worry about a day job anymore. You know, what's funny is I think, at least from my perspective, I thought when we signed a record deal and had our first song on the radio, I thought we had made it. I thought that was, we made it. We're going to be, we're going to be huge. So I was so naive. I had no idea that that was like 1%. The start line. The start line. Yeah. Uh, and so I'm, I'm living in my mind and in my world at that time, like, okay, we're going to play this venue and the next time we're going to do this fin- venue and, you know, in a year we'll be in arenas. I, I thought that's what happened when you had a record deal because of how naive uh, and young and, and ignorant that well, I was. Well, isn't it funny? I think people do that with their lives, too. You know, as I think people think that by the time you hit a certain age, you're going to have a certain milestone right. and you start planning your life out and... You know, it's always funny that it's like, why did you waste the time making the plans? It's never going to quite go how you planned it. Yeah, well, it, it, it actually did with Creed. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, yeah. so it's like... Which is very rare. Very, very rare. I mean, no, I know that now in right. hindsight, you know, looking back. But it was extremely rare. Uh, and, uh, you know, to be, you know, playing in arenas uh, within two years of our first record uh, was an anomaly. You know, that doesn't happen. Um, and so, you know, looking back, it's, it, it, you know, all our dreams were coming true and they were coming true quick. Yeah. And sometimes the quickness can be great and a really fun ride, but also scary and dangerous and can lead to, you know, a big fall. too. Yeah, it, it was a lot of fun. I yeah. mean, we had a blast. Oh, we, I remember we, some of those shows yeah, back in the yeah, day. Yeah, we, we had a blast. And, uh, you know, I mean, with with every every amazing thing that I think happens in our life, we always hit speed bumps. Yeah. Uh, and of course, you know, uh, I did and we did. Um, but you know, we're on the other side of it. Uh, and, and, and life is good on this side. Yeah. Well, that was one of the things I wanted to talk to you about because when we got here to the Wilbur, you know, we walked in and you were doing sound check and I haven't seen you physically in a while. Yeah. And I walked in and I said, Oh my God, he <laughs> looks great. Well, thank you. And, you know, last week when we talked, you were like, my voice is in better shape than it's ever been. Yep. Physically, I'm feeling better. Yeah. And so knowing the hardships and knowing everything that you've gone through, which is all in this record. Yeah. That to see you and be like, wow, no kidding. He's done the work. Yeah, I've definitely, uh, you know, put in the work. I mean, it, it takes work to change your life. Uh, it, it, it takes a commitment and a daily commitment. Um, and for me, what made it something that I could accomplish was looking at it. I've just got to do it today and not worry about tomorrow and not live in the past. Just focus on today and do what I have to do today and then just wake up the next day and start all over. Uh, and then those 24 hour periods started adding up. Um, and here I am five years later and, and, uh, you know, new record. Um, you know, and, and all that's coming with that and, and just a complete change in, in my, my mind, my body, my spirit and my life. And, uh, so I'm very fortunate. I wanted to ask you about the process of it all, because I spend a lot of my time off the radio working with veterans and dealing with um, the suicide epidemic Mm -hmm. and the post-traumatic stress and the depression and the substance abuse and a lot of the things that you've been tackling are the same thing that those guys are tackling as well. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, a lot of the time, the stories don't end positively in, in the rock world and in the music world, as we all are very well aware, but also with those guys. So I really wanted to ask you because you've done the work, Yeah. you know, is there some advice or something? I I just really want to kind of have you talk about, what really worked for you yeah. to hopefully be inspirational to somebody or some of the right. people that I work with and to kind of be able to give, what can I say? What advice can I give? What help can I give? Yeah. I mean, the first thing is, is that you have to be willing to seek help and you can't do it on your own. Uh, so you can't suffer in silence and think that you can, you know, white knuckle it and, and get through it on your own. Um, and so you, you, you've got to seek help. You've got to get professional help. Uh, for me, um, you know, the first four or five times I did that, it didn't work. 
you know. Uh, but I didn't quit. Uh, I kept, I kept trying. I kept trying, and when I would fall, I would get back up, and I would keep trying. Um, and so that's the other thing: is keep fighting, keep doing what you have to do to find health and wellness and sobriety and and happiness because eventually you will find what works for you and it will click in and and it's not the same for everything everybody it's not it's not the same for everybody that's why you've got to continue to keep pushing don't get discouraged by setbacks don't get discouraged when you fail Uh, that's part of the process Uh, you know and so just keep plugging away don't give up don't give up don't give up because eventually you will find something that works for you and you'll get your life back I wanted to talk to you about the creative outlet of the music yeah. and what role it, that played for you mm-hmm. because there's a lot of people that aren't musical right but they find that other creative outlet so talk to me about how important it was to have music as a, a venue for you yeah well it's it's really good and and I'm fortunate to have music uh, in my life because it helped me get outside of my thoughts in my head and thinking about, um, you know, whatever difficulty or urge or, or, you know, however I was feeling if I wasn't feeling right, you know, because it takes a while, it takes a while, um, you know, when you're, you know, finding your health and, and finding sobriety to feel normal again you know, because your body's resetting. And so you, you have these off days and these off periods. And, and for me, I, I had music as an escape uh, to kind of get my mind off thinking about how I felt and, and, and everything that I was dealing with. Uh, the other thing that was a, a tremendous asset for me um, was exercise. Uh, I began exercising religiously. Uh, it was the first thing that I did, uh, you know, when I got up in the morning, either before I took the kids to school or after I took the kids to school. What was, works was, for you? I run. I okay. run. We I'm a runner. To, we need to talk about this because I just ran the Boston Marathon. Okay? <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Um, that runner's high. Yeah, it's great. Ele- okay, where is it? Because I haven't found it. <laughs> I trained for the marathon. I ran all winter in the cold in wow. Boston. Wow. I did the 26.2, the most illustrious wow. and historic marathon. I got little glimmers of it, yeah. but I never got to live in that high for any length of time. Well, Most no, of the time, I was just miserable. Yeah, well, I mean, it's it's not it's not something that you live in for a period of time. It, it it's, it's. Do you just, get it for longer than a mile? Uh, no. <laughs> okay. I mean, I mean, literally, it's it's seconds. Uh, okay. You know what I mean? And and for me, I I, I don't get it all the time, um, but it just became for me about creating new positive habits. <clears throat> in order to make lifestyle changes and changes that are permanent in your life, you have to do a new routine, stick to it, and put time and stick with it because you have to, you have to retrain your mind and body. Uh, and so that's what I did. And I was so fortunate, you know, to have my wife and my family. You've been very, very you know. open about the role that she played oh, in absolutely. all of this. Absolutely. I, I, I say it all the time. She's my Sharon Osbourne. Uh, you know, um, and so her love and her, her commitment to, to me and our family, um, and, you know, even her strength, uh, in, in, in having to, to at one point say to me, Hey, it's, it's me or the kids or continue what you're doing. And that was really my bottom. Uh, and so, uh, and that's a really hard thing. Oh, it was for ve- a woman to have to do. It was very hard for her because that's not what she wanted inside. Right. You know, because she she knew me um, and had years with me uh, and time periods where she knew who I was um, sober uh, and, and not struggling with other things. Uh, and she just wanted that person uh, all the time. Uh, and so, you know, it's good to have strong people in your life, people that, that sharpen you. Uh, that hold you accountable, uh, and that sometimes when necessary, give you tough love. Um, and that was definitely something that she's been so amazing, uh, and, and just really demonstrated to me what a true friend is, uh, and, and what true love is, because a true friend and true love, they don't abandon you 
during the most difficult times. They rally around you. They stick by you. They go through it. They're there. And she showed me that. And uh, so, again, you find out who your real friends are and people who truly care about you when you're going through a difficult time. Uh, and that really made it, you know, glaringly obvious to me uh, about the depth of her love for me. And I'm just, I love her so much for that. When you look back at, at everything that's happened and now, you know, you've taken all that life experience yeah. and you pour it into the space between the shadows. Right. Having gone through what you went through so publicly yeah. and you basically became the, the joke or the punchline, you became the punching bag. I mean, you know, you couldn't get away from yourself in the media and I'm sure your family couldn't either. For a time. I, I mean, you know, people oftentimes, um, you know, they don't know how to respond to something they don't understand. Yeah. Um, and, and also people assume that when you're successful, uh, and you're in the public eye that life is perfect and you have everything you want. Um, and, you know, mental health issues and addiction and alcoholism, they don't discriminate. Right. It doesn't matter what your position in life is. People whether, are learning that now more yeah, than ever. And now, and now it's a part of the conversation. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's just something that, you know, you put yourself out there. And that's part of what being in the public eye that comes with it. Uh, you know, you get the adulation, you get the praise, um, and, you know, and then you get the other side. Um, and so, you know, I've been aware of that for, for a long time. Uh, and, and when it was getting tough on me because of, you know, poor decisions I was making or the lifestyle that I was living, you know, a lot of it I could understand. You know what I mean? So it didn't, yeah. it didn't. Um, it, it, it wasn't like a, of course it wasn't a shock to me, um, you know, but the conversation's changing, uh, and, and people understand. And I just hope that now that I can be an advocate for those, uh, that I can use my experience, um, and what I've learned, uh, and in getting to the place I am in my life now to help other people. Uh, and, and that's really what inspired the song purpose for pain. Uh, was finding a purpose for it all. Yeah. You know, taking these messes um, and turning it into a message. Um, and, uh, and that really is, is a change within your, your perception and view of your past uh, and your experiences uh, because it eliminates any guilt, any shame, um, any embarrassment because now you have something that is an asset for an asset and a tool for you to help someone else uh, who's suffering or struggling because you've been there. Uh, and so, you know, uh, I, I am just glad that, that, you know, I'm here now, but also have this perception change uh, and can take my experience uh, and share it with others and, and hopefully encourage them uh, and help them find the light. When it comes to the new album and you're working on these songs, was there ever a part of you that was like, I just don't even want to put it out there for it to even be criticized. Was there a part of you that was just like, I'm just not going to really, I'm going to write this music for me. I'm not going to release this music. Or were you so driven with, with this message that you were just like, no, I, I, I'm putting it out there. Were you hesitant at all? No, there was no hesitation. I, I, I don't think that's a part of my personality. You know, when I, when I started writing music, um, my goal was always, to write songs and write music that connected with people. Um, and so that, that decision um, was made in me, you know, before we ever even had a record deal, um, before anyone had ever even heard of Creed, um, that, you know, I was gonna bear my soul and put it out there. That's how I create, that's how I write. Um, and so I never even thought of that. Those thoughts never even uh, entered my mind. Because uh, I really feel like from day one in my career, from my first album, uh, I laid it out there. Uh, you know, I think when you come out with a song like My Own Prison, I think that kind of sets the tone for the type of writer that you are uh, and where you pull from. Uh, and so, you know, this record is, is, is no different. 
where is the weirdest place you've come in contact with your own music? I've had bands tell me they've walked into karaoke bars and had people performing it, or you got into an elevator and you heard an instrumental version. Like, yeah. where have you bumped into your own music that was just weird? Uh, I mean, I wouldn't say weird. I mean, I've heard it in all those scenarios. Yeah. Um, I, I think the coolest thing was I was bowling with my kids, <laughs> and it was like a... Um, midnight bowling or whatever where the, the lane, where the, lane, where the lanes stuff. are dark yeah but they had they had big screens that were playing that were playing music and music videos um and so my son and my daughter are bowling and then all of a sudden boom either my sacrifice or higher video comes up on the screen and my kids are like dad it's you <laughs> and and they had never seen those those videos and uh, so it was, that was a cool experience. Uh, and so it wasn't weird, but it was cool. When you look back at those videos, I mean, there was a time when MTV played videos. They just yeah. had their big, you know, 38th anniversary of MTV or whatever. There was a time where just MTV, I know kids, it's a hard to imagine MTV used to just play <laughs> videos all the time. Right. But there was a time where people were throwing exorbitant amounts of money at yeah. these videos and uh -huh. Creed had some of those big award-winning massive set videos yeah is there a time that you look back and go we spent so much money yeah you, you know I do think that um, but it was a different business at the time yeah you know CDs were sold uh, and people were buying CDs so the budgets were much bigger because you had that whole revenue stream right um, and so but yeah looking back um, I mean when you have MTV and VH1 it, it was it was such a great way to get your music out there you wanted to make the best presentation that you possibly could um, and so we were fortunate to have a label that that you know was behind us uh, right. and that invested in us uh, to, to present that You've spent a lot of time in Boston, getting your gear stolen, playing <laughs> playing every venue. Yeah. But have you had a chance to really kind of take some time to enjoy the city? And what are the things you love to do when you're here? I, I've been here quite a bit uh, over the years not working. Yeah. Uh, and I love the city. Uh, and I love going to sports games yeah you know what I mean so if it's an NFL game or a major league baseball yeah, game, yeah we, we have an NFL uh, team yeah you, you do you have an NFL <laughs> team and, and you have a baseball team and you you have a basketball team oh, we got them all a, you have a hockey team yeah. that, that's what I love most uh, about this city uh, is the passion for yeah. the sports uh, when you go to a uh, any professional sport here in Boston it's like no other experience in the yeah. world and so that's what I like to do when I'm here. We like to talk trash about it, too. Yeah. You got to get in that, there. That's the, Boston, that's the Boston attitude. Yeah, man. that's right. I like it. Yeah. And, and, and you know, being a, a, a Florida guy and now a Nashville guy, right? Yeah. yeah. You know, the, the mindset's a little more relaxed. Some people can say we're a little abrasive and too in your face, but you seem to have always kind of liked it. I mean, I, in my youth, when I, you know, years ago, I was very abrasive. Uh, and so I, I could totally identify with the, yeah. with the, the, the Boston attitude, yeah. <laughs> uh, but I've, I've mellowed out much more, uh, in, you know, as I've gotten older and, and, uh, and I like just, I like peace and, and everything to be chill. And I kind of let that animal out, uh, when I'm on stage. Yeah. It's a good place to do it. Yeah. And a lot of, a lot of musicians say that, that they like to just kind of exercise the demons up there yeah. and then you can yeah. just, yeah. Well, before I let you go, uh, our big 50th anniversary is coming up next awesome. year. And so I wanted to know if there was, you know, a, a, a show that you guys played for us or if there was some positive memory of your gear not getting stolen, <laughs> that, that in the 50 years of WAF, when you look back at all the times you've come through town, like, right. like add to that 50th anniversary memory box. Of well, I tell you, I mean, without AAF... Um, you know, Creed, it could easily be said that Creed would not have had the success that it had. Um, you guys were one of the first stations, big stations that mattered, uh, that other stations emulate and copy around the country. So it was so important for us to get on your station and then have success at your station because that had a trickle down effect to the rest of the United States. Um, and so that's one amazing memory because I, I remember we were so pumped 
when you guys added our song we were like no way <laughs> we're on AAF oh my god um and then you know selling out the arena man yeah um and and the shows that we did here that was i mean that that's just to think that that you know we sold out the same arena that Larry Bird played in uh, and and all the greats. Uh, yeah, you go over up on years. that stage and you yeah. look up in those rafters. Right. Even if you're not a fan of the team, the right. history and the, yeah. you know. And none of that would have been possible without you guys, and without you guys supporting our music, uh, you know, exposing it to the city, uh, and and the wonderful people here in Boston who love their rock. Yeah, and they music. do. Yeah, yeah, they do. Yeah. Well, I told you on the phone, you know, it it it's not often that we get to say you know, the, the amazing positive things about the the hardship that people have had. And so it's really nice to be able to say, you know what, no, 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 this is the success story. And so you should be commended for really being as open and honest as you have been about everything, because I really do think it's important yeah. for us to not be able to just talk about you know the tragedies and and reporting the sad news yeah but to really i really appreciate your candor when it comes to talking about how you got through it because yeah. there's so many people in all walks of life and and i'm just so happy for you that yeah. you found that place in your life where things are yeah. good well thank you so you much know, congratulations and i, I know you. that kind of work isn't easy no but, and and thank you so much and i think it's important for people that have a platform uh that have gone through things um to share how they've gotten through it. Um, it's inspirational. And, and to, so they can connect with people who are in the midst of it uh, or who are looking for answers um, to hopefully let them know that they're not alone um, and there is light at the other side uh, and they can continue to fight and get through it. There is hope. Well, Scott, I really appreciate your time. Have a great show yes. tonight. The light show is going to be awesome. We are going to rock it tonight.